Tonight, right now at 5 o'clock, the report on horse racing deaths at Churchill Downs this past spring does not point to one single cause. Thanks for watching. I'm Shay McAllister. And I'm Doug Prophet. The federal investigation also looked right at the dirt surface and the racetrack itself at the historic Churchill Downs after 12 horses died over the springtime. And WHS 11's John Charlton is joining us here right now. He's been going through the port with the latest information on its conclusions. John? Well, Doug and Shay, the report is quite comprehensive, 197 pages long. Included in it was a history of the horses leading up to their catastrophic breakdowns. Now, during the investigation, we interviewed several experts who said figuring out what caused the horse deaths would be a puzzle. Well, today, even with the findings, the cause remains puzzling. There was not one singular factor or smoking gun that caused the spate of fatalities. That was the conclusion after horses started dying at Churchill Downs prior to Derby on Derby Day and through Memorial Day weekend. Horses dying is not okay. 12 horses in all, including Lost in Limbo, seen here, died during the spring meet, forcing racing to move to Ellis Park. Just two days out from horse racing to resume at Churchill Downs, Haiza, the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Authority, released results of the investigation. The learning is that it's a multitude of factors. Multifactorial because, as the report shows, the breakdowns happened on different surfaces and in different spots on and around the track. Several injuries involved broken leg bones, but those bones were often different. Only focus was there during retesting at the track. We were told then that there were no red flags. The report concluded the same, stating surface conditions were similar to prior years. Heiza says the rocks issue has been addressed with new sifting equipment. I think the rock issue has been dealt with and um, is not, uh, cannot explain uh, the injuries that happened at Churchill. Veterinary records and necropsies on all the horses, according to the report, also didn't show any kind of pattern to determine a clear cause. Drug tests for banned substances came back clear as well. And all the tests were negative. Even though it remains a puzzle, Heiza says there are pieces which horse racing can learn from moving forward. The authority also says everything is on the table, including studies on breed these thoroughbreds. Once we, you know, have that data and have that an that analysis, we can then engage in conversations that we can do about it. This is the time where, you know, racetracks and horsemen and breeders and consigners and sales companies, we all have to kind of get behind real change. And after racing in Kentucky, there was also a string of horse deaths up north at Saratoga. Heisa says that tragedy is being investigated as well. Well, in the wake of this report, you know, you know, John, uh, we've had uh, decades of different meets at the at the racetrack. We never really knew about horse deaths unless somebody at the track witnessed it and would tip us off because it was kept in pretty much secrecy. Now you've got the beginning of the September meet at Churchill Downs getting ready to start. Then you have the fall meet. Everybody's going to be right on pins and needles. Every single death's going to be big headlines. Yeah, it'd be an understatement to say that they're not going to be maybe on edge going into this because after these horse deaths not only here but up at saratoga uh, you know the industry is shaky right now and if this happens again it could be catastrophic it could hurt them in the revenue the fans are going to sour on it yeah because a lot of fans are just casual fans and they don't want to see a horse break down on the track all right thank you very much john i'll have more coming up tonight at six shay all right, also happening right here at 5 o'clock, the potential for a strike looms over thousands of Louisville Ford workers. That is, as the auto giant and its union, UAW, have two more days to agree on a new contract. There are two Ford manufacturing plants within the metro, employing a total of more than 12,000 people. The Ford Kentucky truck plant is in eastern Jefferson County, and the Ford Louisville assembly plant is on Fern Valley Road. That's where we find reporter Isaiah Kim Martinez today, looking at how a strike could impact our businesses. Ford workers here at the Louisville assembly plant provide a consistent flow of customers for nearby businesses, which is why for so many of them, particularly the restaurants, so much rides on these negotiations this week. It's business as usual for union workers at the two prominent Ford manufacturing facilities in Louisville at least for the next two days. After that, it's up in the air for right now. Uh, we get a quite a bit of business from the union workers around here. Nearby businesses are watching closely. We 
We supported the Cisco drivers when they were on strike and we we're prepared to stand behind UPS and we will stand behind Ford as well. Mike Smith, manager at Stooges Bar and Grill, tells me union employees make up around 85% of their revenue. His restaurant just down the road from the Louisville assembly plant. Stooges employees wearing these pins in support of the UAW's effort Tuesday. Whether it's before work, after work, or for lunch break, so once we get down to the nitty gritty, you know, it really does, you know, start in our minds about affecting our business. Smith confirms a strike, particularly an extended one, could be detrimental. It's a traumatic uh, experience for the industry when, when it happens for both sides. It's, uh, it's really not good for anyone. Meanwhile, for dealerships, the potential impact could be on the wait for supplies to be delivered. But if we cannot get those parts in, then those parts shipments are going to be delayed which then is going to be a little bit more uh, difficult on our customers. But Kevin Collins at Bill Collins Ford on Bartstown Road believes relations between the auto giant and its union are better now compared to previous years. He believes that bodes well for the result businesses across Louisville all want a done deal. In Louisville, Isaiah Kim Martinez, WHAS 11 on your side. The president of UAW Local 862, Todd Dunn, tells us the ball is in the company's court. He said he's confident in a deal getting done before the deadline, but also says union workers are well prepared to strike if necessary. Earlier today, Kentucky Governor Randy Bashir spoke about what a strike would mean for Kentucky's economy. He said he and his team are closely monitoring the situation, and he does hope the two sides will come up with a win-win situation. UAW are... Uh, thousands of our families here in Kentucky that deserve good wages. We've got to find a win-win here. Kentucky needs a strong Ford and a strong UAW. We need a, a Ford that is profitable, that creates new jobs, that continues to invest, as well as living great wages and benefits for our families. Once again, that strike is set to take place at midnight on Thursday if no deal is reached. We've got darkening skies from our Metro cams right here in downtown Louisville. Looks like a downpour could come out any minute, but uh, if you've been outside today, you know those sprinkles, <laughs> they barely wash the dirt off your windshield. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe tonight a little bit more, Ben. Uh, trying to hold the dust down a little bit. Uh, yeah, just very briefly, you may get uh, one of these moderate showers. It won't last very long. It's just a very thin, broken line uh, with that cold front that's about to bump into the Ohio River. Of course, you can see that as we look at the falls of the Ohio. Temperatures in the mid to upper 70s. Uh, that's where we're at for our high temperatures today. And that's where our temps will stay over the next several days thanks to this cold front moving through. Uh, right now, you've got uh, 77s around Iroquois Park, PRP, Valley Station, Prospect 75. A little cooler behind the front. We're down to 70 in Paoli and Scottsburg also checking in at 70 degrees. So there's that a little line of some showers might be a five or 10 minute shower as it passes on through not seeing any lightning strikes and certainly not severe as that front swings through over the next couple of hours. Notice by sunset right around eight o'clock. Uh, most of that activity is gone off to the east and fading away. Clearing sky tonight and getting rather cool out there. Low temperatures in the 50s, maybe some outlying areas, especially north of the river touching the upper 40s. So maybe uh, needing that light jacket or sweatshirt as you get started tomorrow and then a perfect fall like afternoon tomorrow with our high temps in the mid to upper 70s. So just the beginning of a beautiful weather pattern drying out and clearing out tonight. Low temperature at 58 lunchtime temps in the lower 70s. It can uh, probably crack open those windows. Not much AC needed if at all tomorrow with that high temperature at 78 degrees and low humidity as well with a nice north breeze. I'll show you how long this nice weather pattern will last coming up at our complete forecast in a few minutes. Ben, thank you. More news here tonight at five and we are learning more about the young man who was killed while crossing Dixie Highway at Crumbs Lane. It happened on Sunday night. Well, his family describes the loss as devastating. It's Demetri Dryden Danzi who has special needs. He was hit by a car near the Walgreens right where his sister works. And today, Demetri's family is talking with our Ian Hartwit about how they plan to keep his memory alive because I want to just keep his memory alive as much as I can, even if I have to shed a tear. I don't want to never forget him. And I don't think we, we never will. Sheena Gatson describes her nephew, Demetric Dryden Danzi, as an angel, someone who filled their family with love and joy. But that joy was taken away when a driver hit Demetric while he was crossing Dixie Highway in Shiloh, then took off Sunday night. Well, I'm just sad that my newborn, you know, never got to meet him because 
All the kids love D. Dryden Danzy, known as D by his family, knew this area well. They say he loved to walk around here. His sister even worked at the Walgreens right behind me. And I think that they're going to carry his memory for many, many years. So I want to watch as many videos and keep that alive as much as I can. The memories, she says, might come with tears, but she never wants to forget him. It's him playing karaoke. In Shively, Ian Hardwick, WHAS 11, on your side. Shively police have made an arrest in the case. Joseph Martin is facing charges, including vehicular homicide. Meanwhile, a GoFundMe has been set up to help Dimitrix family with funeral expenses. The Chief Justice of the Kentucky Supreme Court, Lawrence Van Meter, announced today that he will not be seeking re-election in 2024. Chief Justice Van Meter currently also serves as the justice from the 5th Appellate Court District, which includes Bourbon, Clark, Fayette, Franklin, Jessamine, Madison, Scott, and Woodford counties in central Kentucky. Across his career, Van Meter has served as a Kentucky district judge, a circuit judge, an appeals court judge, and for the past seven years, the Kentucky Supreme Court Chief Justice, making him just the third person in Kentucky's history to hold office at all four levels of the state judicial system. In a statement out today, Van Meter said in part, the greatest privileges of my professional life have been to serve the people of Central Kentucky as their justice on the court for the past seven years and to have been elected by my colleagues as Chief Justice. However, the time is right for me to begin a new chapter and to turn the reins over to somebody else. He went on to say that he's making the decision now to give any judges or lawyers who may want to run for his seat plenty of time to decide.